church music or you gonna play the jazz? I said, I'd like to play the jazz. He said, okay. So that was it. So I've been playing jazz ever since. The way we started, we'd, get, we'd borrow the bass from high school, we'd borrow the drums from high school, uh, they'd borrow the alto, whoever played the alto saxophone, then we'd go get on the streetcar and go to, to a gig, you know, and play the dance. We played dances at school, we played dances uh, at the roller rink, the Forest Club roller rink. So we had a lot of places. The Mirror Ballroom, the Greystone Ballroom, that's where you heard Bird and all of them. Mirror Ballroom, Greystone Ballroom, the Grand Ballroom. The last time I think I heard Bird was maybe at a bar at the Mirror. I don't know when we became so conscious of jazz. I really don't. I think it probably started with Boogie Woogie. <laughs> things. Then when I went to the west side of town, the cats over there, they couldn't chord as good as I could, but they could solo. And so I got real upset about that. I said, I can't solo. So the blind girl, Bess, you know Bess. Mm -hmm. Bess, Bess loaned me this record player. And it was a record player where you could take the little thing and you could make it any speed you wanted it. And as it went down in a whole octave and you could stop anywhere in between. I slowed him up and I started learning those solos. And you know what it was? The first record, Web City. Can you imagine? That's why when people say you play like Bud Powell, I guess I do. <laughs> That's how I started out, you know? <laughs> and it was so full of energy and vitality, but also it was just, it was explosive as opposed to the more uh, lambent and melodic styles of, of Art Tatum and Teddy Wilson and, and the musicians before whom who they loved. I mean, you can hear a lot of Art Tatum and Barry Harris is playing, for example. But uh, this was a new way of playing music and consequently a new way of thinking about yourself and thinking about yourself in relationship to the society in which you lived. But invented the language of modern piano and Barry mastered it and used it to create his own style. One time Bud Powell was sort of messed up in Bird Birdland, the last gig he had. And he started playing. And it's like he was playing on top of the keys and I could hear him so on. And it was Every once in a while you'd hear a little note. But you knew he was playing, and it's like he was gliding over the keys. You know, and that's what you had to end up doing. Barry was part of this amazing group of piano players that came out of Michigan at the same time. It's just one of those incredible things. I don't know how to explain it. Tommy Flanagan was there, the Jones brothers, Hank Thedd and, and uh, Elvin. I've been knowing Barry so long because we were teenagers when we met. We were both uh, uh, interested in the same kind of music, uh, which was the beginning of early bebop. Tommy Flanagan was very good, real shy kind of cat. I went to his house one time, but I used to go stand. You know, I, when I go to see Tommy, I like to watch him. I like to see his hands. I've spent my life watching his hands, see? <laughs> I 
I spent my first part of my life I spent watching his hands so that if he had a chord, I say, uh huh. And I go home and I play that chord in every key. I remember that chord. I had to remember a few chords, you know. So that's that's how that's how I learned how to play. Well, it was very uh, it's exciting for us growing up because all the uh, all these heroes that we uh, still listen to till today, they were coming through Detroit quite often, which is just marvelous for us. Paradise Theater was uh, uh, about five blocks from uh, the high school that I went to, so it was a regular thing to, after school was over to you know, hit it right down there. You have to remember about bebop that it's, that's a press name. What we're really talking about is modern jazz. We're talking about a, a, a real shift in the music. Dizzy Gillespie would use this onomatopoeic uh, kind of scat to uh, sing an idea to someone if he didn't have a piano handy or his horn handy. And a lot of the phraseology ended in drum figures like bebop. But it, you, you get into the World War II, a lot of African Americans went abroad and saw that they were treated like men, and they weren't going to come back and, and accept the same kind of situation that they had left. And uh, the swing era was dying. There was a guy who had some brand new tricks, played his horn on a crazy kick. The thing that made him such a flop was he beat, or when he should have bopped. Sam will catch up right up on the stand, but he couldn't seem to dig the band. He thought he was the cream of a crop, but he beat, or when he should have bopped. All cats gathered around to see what he was trying to do. At Minton's and Monroe's Uptown House, the bandstand might be crowded uh, at some points, and they would weed out the lesser players by playing these new chord changes, these new sequences, and it developed that kind of small group ethos. The period was just ripe for something new to happen. And then what, what it really takes is, it, is some sort of genius who comes along and does things in a way that no one else has ever done it. And people of his generation hear it and they say, yes, that's what we've been waiting for. Dizzy Gillespie once said to me, we had the notes. We knew how to do all that. We understood the harmonies, but Charlie Parker told us how to get from one note to the next. I don't want people to think that I played with Bird. You know, they say, oh, you played with Charlie Parker. I sat in with Charlie Parker. I can remember one, one time when I really sat in with him, his band didn't show up. And so we went up and played with him at the Greystone Ballroom. We went up and played with Charlie Parker, and he was beautiful to us. That's one thing about Bird. Everybody I ever heard play with him, they sounded good. You know, all the cats, so we all sounded good with Bird. We had a lot of jazz around us. We had uh, so many cats. And so many cats came to, like my house was like a, a mecca, like, you know, everybody came there, most of the musicians. You know, I tell people, you know, I name some of the musicians that came to my house, and it's probably some people don't believe me, you know. They, like I might say, Joe Henderson used to come take lessons, you know. Now he's a famous tenor player today, <laughs> you know and uh, Paul Chambers. But you know, a friend of mine the other day found a, a yearbook, a downbeat from 1958. And you know, I kept, I kept this too, because I, I had to show it to people when they'd start doubting you. The major jazz influence in that city has been an excellent young pianist, Barry Harris. He feels that every, virtually every immigrant from Detroit in the last five years has been either taught or influenced by Barry. He is prominent both as, as a musical as well as a social force. As baritonist Pepper Adams said in Downbeat, 
He's just a young cat, but he's influenced more youngsters in right playing and right living. See that? You know, we just had a, we had a house. I was lucky. I had a house. My mother would fix food for us. What little food we had, <laughs> but she'd fix it. And we'd jam all day, you know? Well, Detroit was a hotbed uh, for jazz in the early 50s. It was one of those cities where Charlie Parker's impact in the 40s had an almost immediate effect and a lot of young players came up uh, enamored of it and wanted to play it and around I think 1954 Barry went into the Bluebird Club which was became the best known club in part because Barry was playing there and he would accompany a lot of the players who came through. I accompanied Prez for a week, I accompanied Flip Phillips, I accompanied Nancy Wilson for a week you know, people like that. I, I accompanied quite a few. Uh, I remember those. And he quickly earned uh, so high a reputation that when musicians came into uh, to Detroit, they would re request him, and occasionally they would just leave their piano players at home. I was a pianist who <laughs> I was known before I even left town. Uh, people came looking for me almost, you know. That's how I met uh, Sonny Clark, Walter Davis. All the, all the New York cats came looking for me, you know. Well, a lot of guys who came in, Miles Davis and you know Dexter, a lot of people who came through started to uh, use Barry. And then uh, Cannibal came in and left with him. He took him out and, and brought him back to, to New York. I guess that was in 1960. <laughs> That's why we came to...